Let's read this together, Matthew 22. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Today, Father, I ask you to do what you, what only you can do, Holy Spirit, to come and to teach every single person what you have for them today. Go beyond what I can do as a teacher. We need your help so when we leave here today, we would have an understanding of what love looks like and what that means in relationships, every person that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And so for several weeks, we've been talking about love and, and understanding that Jesus was emphasizing in a very strong way here that love really manifests through relationships. You ever find that out? Uh, you need to have relationships in life, and whether or not you're walking in love really starts to be de demonstrated in those relationships. We found out it's never wrong to love. It's never out of order to love. You do not compromise when you love, and you never lower your standards when you love. And, and so many times in relationships, especially close ones, we can get hurt along the way, and we feel like, man, I don't know if I can do this love anymore. Well, we need God's help. And we need to ask him to help us so we can love the same way that he loves us. And that may seem impossible, but even though it's impossible with men, all things, somebody say all things, is, impo or is possible with God. Read this with me, if you will, 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Nor does it behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Say that with me. Say love. love. Say never fails. And so we see here that really God is showing us that we can love. And, and we found out last week that love is not an emotion. All right. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. Say choices. You choose to love. And, and God asks us to choose to love the same way that he loves us. This morning, for the next few moments, what I want to talk about is a topic that I believe touches every one of us in some form or another, and that's about how to love in marriage, how to love in marriage, because marriage was God's idea, and you may be here this morning, and maybe you're single, but statistics prove that 75% of adults at some point in their life will get married, and so this applies to most of us. If not, it certainly will help you, I believe, even in your uh, interpersonal relationships with people of the opposite sex, understanding how to respect people, how to love people, but certainly in marriage, it's extremely important, because marriage was God's idea. First book of the Bible, you see a man and a woman coming together in marriage. In the very last book of the Bible, it speaks of another marriage, which is called the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the Bible's very specific that marriage is a reflection with a husband and wife is a reflection or a picture of Christ's love for his church. Healthy marriages, I believe, are still one of the main ways that God builds his church and intends for strong families to reach out and to influence the world around us. Malachi 2, it says this, but did he not make them one having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And someone may read this passage of scriptures here where it says that God hates divorce. But let me say this, God does hate divorce, but he does not hate the divorcee. He loves people who have been through divorce, and he wants to help them to either get back into that relationship. In some cases, it is possible, or to be married again if they so choose to, and to have a healthy marriage. But listen, even if we choose to marry after having a failed marriage, if we don't apply God's principles, we're going to end up the same place we did with that first relationship. And so it's really important that we realize that God hates divorce. Why? Because it destroys family. And you may think, well, that's the unpardonable sin. I know before I came to Christ, I had heard just enough religion and in my own idea because I was married before I was saved in a failed marriage. I thought for sure because I was divorced, I was going to hell, and, and I was convinced of it till I found the truth. But the truth is, you know, there's a lot of things the Bible says that God hates. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 6, I'm not going to turn there, but it goes through a whole list of items that all of us have probably committed at least one, probably 
all of those at some point or another. God hates it. Why? Because it, it really changes lives. It hurts lives. It hurts people. And he wants to show us how to have a proper, strong marriage. And the enemy is extremely aware of the power of a strong marriage. And I believe that's why in our society we see such an all-out attack, if you will, on family values, an attack on men, on women, on gender, and equal rights, and all these things because the enemy wants to attack marriages and wants to attack families because it's God's idea. In fact, divorce statistics inside the church are as high and many times higher than those in the world. So I know that there's a lot of work to do and we need to really choose to look at things the way God does because God takes marriage seriously. God did not design marriage for you to play house and to hope for the best. It's not about, well, this is going to be fun. We'll just chase each other around the house and have lots of fun, and nothing's ever going to be challenging. No, to stay married for years and build a healthy marriage does take work. Trish and I have been married now for almost 31 years, and it has taken work. We've had to put the other one first. We've had to lay our lives down. You need to fight for your marriage. It's worth the battle. In fact, let me say this to you single people. Fight for the marriage God has for you. Keep yourself pure. Become the person that you're looking for. So many times we're looking for Mr. Right or, or Mrs. Right. Become that person, and God is going to set you up to be able to have a successful marriage. Get in relationship with him. Pursue him. Serve in the body of Christ and allow God to bring you your mate. If you're married, stay married. We need to believe that divorce is not even an option. It's worth every, every battle. And I believe that outside of adultery, physical abuse, or abandonment, you and I are called to stick it out. And I already mentioned just a few moments ago, I think in some of those cases, if there's repentance, if there's forgiveness, if healing can come, then you can have a successful marriage. I've seen people that have gone through adultery and physical abuse and things like that and both allowed Christ to touch them and have stronger marriages today. That may not be your case, but it could very well be your case. Say love. love. Say never. never. Fails. Yeah. And we need to trust God. Genesis 23, it says this, Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke to them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at full price as property for a burial place among you. So that Machpelah literally means double or couples. And not only was Abraham and Sarah buried there, but Isaac was buried there, Rebekah was buried there, Jacob was buried there, Leah was buried there. It's the cave of doubles or couples, if you will. And I believe that if we're going to have marriages and end up in the cave of couples at the end of our marriage, then we need to look at God's view of marriage and how to have a healthy one. I already mentioned earlier that Adam and Eve were the first married couple in the Bible. So let's turn there, Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And all the single men said, you're right. It's not good to be alone. It's not. Looking for the right woman. Like I said, you become the right man and you'll find that right woman. But it says here that it's not good for man to be alone. New Living Translation says someone just right for him. King James Version says help meet. Someone to come to help you out. How many know men need all the help they can get? Do you ever find that out? Guys, we need help. So God brings a woman to help you in life, to be your helper, to pick up the slack, to help you become all that you can be because you need help. Genesis 2.23, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I want to say a couple of things here, and this may not be real popular in our society. I get that. But like I said, I believe marriage is under attack. Um, gender is under attack. Our identity is under attack. Families are under attack. But you notice it says here that he gave him a woman. He didn't give Adam another man. And if you struggle with homosexuality, please hear me out. God has a better plan for you. And I know some people don't want to hear that, but listen, God forgives us when we sin. And I'm not saying homosexuality is worse than any other sin. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But listen, there's a better way. And God can help you to overcome that temptation. We all face temptations in some way or another when it comes to sex and sexual relationships. But God didn't bring him another man. He brought him another woman. And let me just say this, guys. Didn't you notice he didn't bring him three women? <laughs> Come on, all you need is one godly woman. That's all that God said. I'm going to bring him a helper. 
And all the wives said, Amen. And all the girls preparing for marriage said, Amen. Amen. Say one woman. So God designed it that way. We think, well, you know, if I just, and that's what we think. We say, well, you know, I'm not feeling honored at home, and we'll get to some of that. Well, maybe if I just have this affair over here, it's going to make me complete. No, it's going to make your life a disaster. That is the truth. You may enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but it will wreck your life. I guarantee to you. Say one man. Say one woman. God made them male and female. And God looked at man. He stated that his number one need was divine help. All right? Our number one need is divine help, and, and, and that's in the form of a woman. And why is that? Because I believe women are multipliers and incubators. They bring increase and nurturing to everything. And, and you know, people say, well, you know, women are equal to men. No, women are better than men. All right? I, I, I believe that. We all are strong in certain ways, but there's something that a woman does. And, and so I, I believe in equality, and God loves us all. But there are things that women do that men don't even have a clue. And if you're going to have a successful life, most of us. Now, some of us are called to be single. I believe that, some. But in a marriage, you need to realize, man, how important your wife is. And she is a help me to help you. Um, you think about it. A man just gives her a seed, and nine, ten months later, you got a baby. All right, they're incubators, they're increasers, they're multipliers. You can take a bachelor pad. I had fun with this first service. First service, Sarah and JD just got married a little over a year ago. And I mean, if you were over at JD's house when he was single, he literally lived in a cave. All right, I'm not, I'm not making fun of him. I, I did the same thing first service, so he heard it. And then him and Sarah get married, and she said, I'm not having nothing to do with this. She had it looking pretty. It looked a whole lot better. They were painting and making it look nice. Then they said, well, we're going to sell it, and you ought to see the place they live now. Because, see, women bring increase. Women bring nurturing. Women are multipliers and incubators, and they can take a bachelor pad and turn it into a home. And I believe that with all my heart. So, guys, prepare yourself to be the man that a woman would want, and God will bring you that woman to help you and make your bachelor pad look a whole lot better. All right. <laughs> Let me just say this. Men, cherish your wives. Appreciate them. Even if you're single... Cherish women. Appreciate women for who they are. In our society, we just think so much that everything's about sex, and so many times men think women are just about sex. The Bible's very clear that sex inside of marriage is a gift from God. Outside of marriage, it's fornication or adultery. It's not right. Same-sex sex, it doesn't matter. If you have sex with a woman, with a man, it doesn't matter. If it's not in marriage, God says it's not holy. And, and, and we're in a society that really we believe that sex is our right. And let me just say this, even though the Bible's very clear that sex inside of a marriage is very important, and it is for a healthy marriage, and, and I understand that sometimes there may be physical complications where that may be impossible, but God's design is for it to be very healthy in marriage. But we're in a society where we think, well, it's my right. It's not your right to have sex. God never said that. He said in marriage, he brings it. Why? For a godly seed, but it's also something that makes you complete one another in what God has planned, and it's very healthy for your marriage. But outside of marriage, it is not healthy. And we see the problems it's caused in our society. But the truth is, men, if you're not cherishing your wives, if you're not appreciating them, if you're not loving them properly and valuing them as a person, it's going to determine God hearing your prayers or not. Look what it says in 1 Peter 3. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Your prayers will be hindered by the way you treat your wife. And I believe this is true for, for women as well. But listen, the man is the spiritual head. And I believe that whatever success, whatever measure of success a man enjoys, his wife had a profound impact on it. Men, remember your wives. Remember them, the way you treat them, the way you talk to them, the way that you represent them the way you speak to your children about them, the way you speak to people that you work with about, oh, I'm getting messy now. But man, you need to respect your wives. Um, remember, we want to make it to the cave of couples. I don't know about you, but I, and, and you know, I have to admit, I like football. I'm a diehard Lions fan. I don't know. It's kind of like hit yourself with a two by four over and over and over. You know, at least take the nail out, but you know, just keep it. And, 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 and you know, I, 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 like, I like football. But listen, I think we need more couples caves than we do man caves. Help me out, somebody. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with having a place that you can get away, and men need their time away from each other. I realize that. 
And if you have a man cave, I'm not criticizing you. But so many times, we just want to retreat to that and just escape life. Men, we need a couple's cave. We need to do things with our wives. We need to support our wives. We need to build strong marriages. Psalm 127.1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. When the Lord builds the house of marriage, it is built to last. Each spouse striving together, praying together, dreaming together about the future, following God's design for their lives together, raising kids, doing life together. And I'll just say this. I said at first service, and even if you're in a marriage and you're unable to have children, listen, God still, through your strong marriage, can be a witness to your nieces, your nephews, your neighbors, the people that you have friendships with. In having a strong marriage, you are going to influence the people around you, and that is God's design. Uh, research shows that statistically, all right, the happiest couples are those who have been married for 30 to 35 years. So Trish and I are heading into 31 years. We are heading in to the happiest times of our marriage. Phew. Say, somebody say this. Say, stick it out. All right. And, and typically, listen, this is why. It typically takes the first 9 to 17 years, all right? Let, hang in. 9 to somebody. Her, Hannah, you're going to make it. All right. <laughs> nine to 17 years to die to yourself. I mean, statistically, most divorces, most divorces, not all, but most, happen in the first nine years of marriage. And there's a lot of dying to self that has, and that's on both parties, by the way. That's not just on the men. And we're going to break this down in a few minutes with men and women. But listen, we need to die to our, so if you're going to have a healthy marriage, you need to lay your rights down. You don't have any rights in marriage. You put your spouse first. Husbands, you put your wife first. Wives, you put your husband first. And I, I was just really, really blown away. And I checked this out in several different reports, read different things. And the Bible, or not the Bible, but statistics prove that 70%, 70% of men will cheat on their wives. Now, this is not just men in the church. This is everybody, all right? So the statistics may be lower in the church, but 70%, I couldn't believe it. I read this, all, I mean, I found this in so many places. But listen to this, women will cheat on their husbands 60%. That, that just amazed me, but I saw that it was true in so many things I read. And under the marriage covenant, the two become one flesh. Say one. And we need to have a respect for the marriage covenant. And violating that covenant devastates both parties. Infidelity can be forgiven. But listen, scars from infidelity are permanent. It hurts. It shatters trust, maybe even making it hard to trust another person again. Severs relationships. It degrades you. It destroys families. See, marriage is about giving. Adultery is about taking. And in a marriage, you give. You give yourselves to one another. You don't take what is not yours. And, and even in marriage, taking, abusing your partner is wrong. It's something that you freely give to one another. And, and even in, 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 the, in the act of sex, holding that back as punishment for something is totally wrong. God's, and I don't have time to get into all the scriptures, but 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is, is pretty uh, in detail if you want to read that. And really just valuing yourself, your body is your spouse's. Can I just say that? So it's not something you withhold, it's something that you give. And, and if, if we want to get it, man, we need to treat our wives properly. Okay, that is not like all she is. And in our society, men in particular, women as well, but men in particular look at the opposite sex, women as sex objects. Understand, it's kind of like, hey, my eyes are up here. My eyes are up here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Some of you got that. All right. The, the rest of you are so doggone holy, you didn't get that. But... <laughs> but we're in a society where we're bombarded with that stuff. Women have value. Marriage is about giving. Adultery is about taking. And that's why adultery is sin. Um, and let me just say this. If there's been infidelity in your marriage, it, it will take work. But I believe that a crisis could turn into an opportunity. I think I already said this, but I have known people that have taken uh, an adulterous affair in a relationship and chosen to forgive, and it will take work, all right, to take some counseling, some prayer, getting with a pastor or a leader or somebody and working through some forgiveness issues and learning to trust all over again. But if you've been in a, in a relationship like that, would you consider maybe remarrying that person? Maybe saying, we're, we're done, we're going to start over? Or maybe you've been divorced. Maybe would you consider remarrying that person? I know that isn't going to work in every case. But listen, I believe it is a testimony. Listen, anybody can get a divorce. 
And, and some of us have been divorced, and God doesn't hate you because you're divorced, and God will give you another chance. But understand, it is worth the work if it's something you can do. If you're in your second marriage or even your third marriage, stay married, all right? Say, well, I'm just waiting for that perfect spouse. You've got them right now, all right? Whoever you're married to, you stay married to them. And, and outside of adultery or something, abuse, I understand that. But, but stay married. Many couples work through difficulties and end up having very strong marriages. All right. Because statistics are so high about aff uh, with affairs, I want to teach you over the next few moments how to affair-proof your marriage. And you should take notes whether you're married or going to get married. This will help you a whole lot. If you're, even if you're going to stay single, you've got to control your thoughts. And so this is important. So number one, if you're going to affair-proof your life, if you're going to affair-proof your marriage, you need to get it out of your head, Matthew 5.29. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you than one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, Jesus wasn't saying literally pluck your eye out and throw it. He said you need to take authority over the things that you're looking at and whatever you need to do. See, the temptation to cheat begins with just one thought. Jesus was talking about the lust of the eyes and controlling it. Are you willing to pluck out that wandering eye? Are you willing to cancel your subscription to Playboy? <laughs> Are you ready to get rid of certain channels on TV? Listen, I think some, even TV shows that people will think are just harmless. It's amazing to me some of the ways families and relationships are portrayed. And if we're not careful, we are going to really accept the world's view of marriage and family and relationship. And it's not the same as God's. It really is not. Don't click on certain websites. If you need help, have somebody set up a password on your computer, your iPad, and tell them to just forget it. Boy, that would, that would amp it up a little bit, wouldn't it? Say, man, I'm having a hard time with this. Would you set up a password on here for me and don't remember it and I don't want to hear it? Hmm, that's a good idea for you. That's what I do on my iPad. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a password on there. I asked Bob to do it, so I can't. I said, I'm not even going to be tempted with that. Put it on there. Can't get on it. See, the enemy is going to creep into your home through the eye gate of technology. And adultery will always begin with your thoughts. Watch your words and the things that you look at because they're going to become your thoughts. And what happens is thoughts become your actions. Actions become habits. Habits become character. And character is what influences your destiny, the outcome in your life. So building good character, you, people want to know, well, how do I have a successful life? Build your character one day at a time, one thought at a time. One week at a time, one year at a time. Listen, it's a lifelong plan to build your character, and then you can have a healthy marriage, a healthy family. Somebody said amen. amen. Number two, respect one another. And I don't have time this morning, but if you want to read it, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33 roughly, really talk about how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, and the example that's used is Christ and his church. Ephesians chapter 5. And let me just say this. Be more interested in respecting one another rather than casting blame. <laughs> Fix problems rather than fight about them. And the question I think really is, do I want to be reconciled with my wife, with my husband, or do I want to be right, doggone it? And so many times, I'm just going to be right. I ain't given an inch. You are going to have problems in your marriage. I guarantee you with that attitude. So respect one another. Number three, take responsibility. Philippians 2, 4, let each one of you look not only at, out for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Major problems come from one word. Would you like to know what that word is? I'm glad you asked. All right. It's selfishness. Listen, even if you're a single adult, and if you don't get married, if you're one of those few people that don't get married, you are going to have better friendships and relationships if you don't choose to be selfish. And, and, and I'll say this. You don't even realize you're selfish when you're single. <laughs> but you get into a relationship and you get married and you start to realize, oh my gosh, are they really going to leave that there every day? I don't know about you, but in our house when I was growing up, my mom did all the laundry. Ouch. You got to take responsibility. See, here's the truth. Selfishness is a heart matter. Selfishness is a heart matter. Deeply ingrained through your habits, through your routines, 
Listen, we just become selfish. When we're, when we're just taking care of ourselves, living by ourselves, we just are selfish because it's all about me. And so God wants to break that down. And I really believe that that is really one of the things the Word of God does. The Word of God gives us a perspective from somebody else's eyes, from somebody else's viewpoint. All right? This is what other people see in you because you can't see it yourself. How many know you have blind spots? Um, I think, Hannah, you had a word at our retreat we just had. We just got away with some of our, our, our leaders in the church, and just, it was a great time. And she had a word about where uh, she saw the Lord weeding her garden, you know, spiritually. And then there were times that he would go, and she couldn't see him, so he was weeding parts that she couldn't see. And, and, and the revelation really is that Jesus will weed places you cannot see. The Word of God will develop your character in places where you can't even see that you're selfish. And he'll reveal it to you, and you'll go, oh, my gosh, I'm that person. See, so many times we read the Word of God, and we say, oh, yeah, I wish so-and-so would read this. No, you just read it. You pray for them and, and let God work on you, all right? And, and really, it's like a mirror that reveals what we look like to others. And so I believe reading our Bible, plugging into a good Bible teaching church, uh, planting ourselves in God's house, getting involved in ministry, because then you have relationships. You've got to work through problems. Okay? Back to marriage. Rekindle the romance. You want a healthy marriage? Rekindle the romance. Do you remember when you first started dating? Or do you remember the first time you go on a date with somebody, you get all butterflies and, oh, I wonder what he or she's going to talk about and I wonder what their interests are and will they really like me? But you, and then you meet them and, oh, this is fun. You can't wait for the next time, all right? Cultivate romance again. And if you don't, if you're not careful, the fun can go right out of your relationship. It's the truth. It doesn't just happen by accident. And I remember, you may be here and say, well, we can't even afford to go out because I think having, having a date night's important, getting away, doing things. You know, and Trish try, and I try to do that on a regular basis, and it's a little easier because we're kind of empty nesters, so we do have some time at home, but getting away is so important. But I, well, well, not right now, you know, because we got a grandson who's large and in charge, but... <clears throat> yeah, so... <laughs> But I can remember, and, and, you know, Tony and Aaron are here this morning, our two sons, and, and they, they, uh, they'll remember this. When they were little, we, didn't have, we couldn't afford to go on a date. We didn't have the money. And so Chris, Trish was so creative, and it's worked out well. And they all know we'd be like, and they were little, and I know how little kids are. And if you have little kids, you know. We say, okay, you guys are going to have to stay in your room. We have a date tonight. We make a big deal out of it. And Trish would get candles and light the candles. They'd get their dinner, and then we'd have our dinner. And they'd be peeking out of the room, you know. But they, but they, but they learned, listen, they learned to let us have that. And what they learned, and we told them this. We said, you know, as much as we love you, and we will always love you, we told all our kids this. And they know that to this day. And, and really, our children have become some of our best friends. It's the truth. It really is. We're still parents, but they're, they're friends. I love hanging out with them. They have wisdom that they help me with. I help them. And, but we told them when they were very little, we said, we love you. We will always help you. We'll always cherish you, forgive you. But one thing you need to realize Trish is more important to me than you. Listen, it's true. And, 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 and you may think, well, how could you do that? No, it's the truth. All right? All right? Your children don't belong to you anyway. You, know, you realize that, right? Okay. They, they grow up and they, they, they leave. And then they'll come back if, if you have a safe place because they know you and your wife or you and your husband put yourselves before them. So they know they now have a, a healthy home to come home to. Our kids love to come over. They do. There's times it's like, man, do you have to come over again? No, I'm just kidding. We love having them over. But, they, but, but it's the truth. But you can create that environment. And, and you know, no, nobody's perfect. And I think one of the things we did, uh, I just say this here with our kids, and again, why we probably have good, healthy relationships with them, is when they were little, we apologized. I blew I said, you know, I'm sorry. I made a promise to you. I shouldn't have made that promise. I didn't fulfill that promise. But one thing I can tell you is God fulfills his promises, and I'm trusting in him, and I think he's going to help us, and he's going to help you, and he'll be with you the rest of your life. So pray for me, and we would. I'd say, Lord, just help me to help them to forgive me, and, and we'll just move on from here. And we taught them that, that it's forgiveness. So you, you need to rekindle the romance. That's where I was. So I think it's number whatever it is, four. Have a made-up mind. <clears throat> Have a made-up mind. Trying times are not times to stop trying. Okay, let me just say that. Um, when things are tough, when things aren't going good at home, don't decide to flirt with your coworker. That is a mistake. Say mistake. mistake. Say run. run. <laughs> there's, a, there's a story in the Bible. Joseph was, was wrongly accused. 
all right, of trying to rape Potiphar's wife. Wrongly accused. The Bible says that she tried to lure him in. And the Bible says he ran, he ran so quick that she was cold holding his coat. He just said, I am out of here. Listen, men and women, that's what you need. You need to run. If things aren't going right at home, you tough it out, get back home, and make it right. Don't be looking for somewhere else. Say, well, if I just get me a hottie over here. I mean, sometimes we get middle age, 40, 50 years old, say, I just need to get me two 20-year-olds. They'll kill you. So you stop thinking that way. We get these dumb ideas. Come on, I'm preaching good. Don't shout me down. You start to think stupid. Who do you think you are anyway? Remember, God gave him one woman, all right? Say one woman. So have a made-up mind. Marriage is going to endure storms. Um, and it's not just a battle the enemy has with your marriage. It's really out to destroy your family. That's what he's trying to do is to wreck, because that's what divorce does. It hurts families. It really, really does. And even though uh, a husband and a wife can move on and maybe have a very healthy relationship beyond divorce, divorce hurts and divides families. It really does. It really does. Leonardo da Vinci was uh, reported as having said, an arch consists of two weaknesses which leaning one against the other make a strength. And in marriage, it's true. You confess your weaknesses, your, your, your strengths to one another. You help each other. You lean on one another. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says two are better than one because you help one another. And so in marriage, it's working together, not resisting, not fighting, not fighting for your rights, but working together in your weaknesses, you become a strength. And here's what happens in, in healthy relationships. I had many more rough edges than Trish, and I still have more rough edges than Trish. But what ends up happening is I do have some strong, good, healthy qualities, as well as she does. And she's got, she's got a few rough edges. You don't see them, but they're there. And what ends up happening is in a relationship, you really, as iron sharpens iron, so a, a friend sharpens his friend. In marriage, that's even deeper because you know each other so well. If you'll allow yourselves to grow in intimacy with one another and to help each other, we don't even want to talk about our weaknesses. We just want to, it's my way or the highway. I'm in charge around here. Listen, that's not what I mean by men leading their homes. All right? God's in charge. And God tells you how to lead your home, and it's to humble yourself and to lead your wife and set the example by reading the Bible, by praying. So many times I think the guys sit on the sidelines and say, well, you know, my wife, she reads the Bible. She knows the Word. You need to know the Word. Now, you, your, your wife may be more gifted scholastically. Maybe, maybe she can teach better or she's more prone to that remembers things better. You know, amazing. You guys say, well, I just can't remember the Bible. Yeah, but you can quote all the statistics of the Denver Broncos from the time they started till today. It amazes me. Some of the things guys rattle off and say, well, I just can't understand the Bible. No, you don't want to understand the Bible. All right? So you, you need to get an understanding. Since I'm talking about men, let's read this, Joel 3, 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Listen, you need to prepare for war and lead your families. And I applaud single moms and women that have to raise their children alone because you were abandoned or, or maybe your spouse passed away early or whatever. My hat's off to you. I, I don't know how you do it, but the Bible says that he will help you if you're single. But men, we need to lead if you're in that place, you need to lead your wife, lead your children, teach them how to pray, teach them how to read the Word of God. I mean, and I know it's not easy. You may feel sometimes like, I don't even know the woman I married five years ago or 15 years ago. Well, work at getting to know her again. You know, you need to work at this. Stand up, step up, play the man, lead, don't follow. Watch what's happening under your roof. Like I said before, computers, TVs. And just get rid of some of that junk. I, and, and, and here's the thing. Like I say, I, I suffer through a Lions game every now and again. And I, you know, I, I'm not against TV. I, I watch the news a little bit. And I don't mind a good movie once in a while. But I'll tell you, the more I grow in Christ, the less I even want to watch TV. Is just Look, if you, and if you like to, like, you know, marathon watch your favorite program, that's okay. I'm not, I'm not telling you what to do. That can be relaxing. But just for me. It's something, and I used to love to watch. I mean, I watched too much TV at one point, okay? So for me, it's just better. You may not have an issue with that. But I've just found out it's just, it, it's just it's not there. 1 Corinthians 16, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. So what does that mean, man? It means that you forgive again. Say you're sorry again. I'll tell you, nothing speaks louder to your spouse and your family when you say, I'm sorry. 
I mean, so many times, man, we can't say we're sorry for nothing. Speak words of encouragement over your wife and your family. Pray for God to help you lead well. You know, uh, learn how to have conversations with your children, with your wife. Communicate to them in more than just a grunt as you head to the man cave. Hey, make me a sandwich while you're at it. I mean, you know, you, you, we, we need to learn how to communicate. We say, well, I'm just not a good communicator. Oh, no, you're communicating a whole lot by not talking. All right? So, well, I'm just not a talker. No. <laughs> now, you may not be a talker. Some people just love to talk. I mean, you know, some people, it's like, man, do they ever shut up? But I understand I'm not one of those people. All right. <laughs> And I know everyone doesn't have the gift of gab. I understand that. But we need to learn how to communicate. Talk to our kids. Talk to our spouse. All right? Now I'm going to pick on the women for a moment. I told Trish she could help me just to bail me out in case it gets kind of sticky in here. All right. Proverbs 14.1. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Listen, women, by wisdom, you can build your home. You can build your house, but you can tear it down with foolishness. What does that mean? You need to realize that your home is your classroom. You are leading in your home. You need a clear vision to have victory for your marriage, for your children, and you need to build that vision on Jesus Christ. Proverbs 31.10, it says, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. And there's nothing wrong, women, with you know, wearing some makeup and doing your hair and all that stuff, and, and, and that's all fine and dandy. But understand, what gives you value is a woman. Listen, what gives you value as a woman is your virtue, the character that God is building on the inside. When rough times come, are you grounded in the word of God? Or when rough times come and it looks like it's going to be hard to pay the bills, you just say, I told you not to buy that. You should have listened to what I told you to do. And that's when he goes, I'm going to the man cave. Ooh. Not always the case, but it sure can drive him there. Who can find a virtuous wife? Her worth is far above rubies. That's, that, you're valuable. And you women, you have the ability to create a life-giving atmosphere in your home. You've heard the saying, if mom ain't happy, what? Ain't no answer. All these, these young women, they know that one. Because eh? there ain't nobody happy if I ain't happy. See, that, if mommy is truth, true, you can set the atmosphere in your home. You really, really can. Um, and I know you may be in, in that season of diapers and you don't get enough sleep, or you might be in your, in your marriage and some years have passed and you're like, you've lost that love and feeling. Oh, that love. Love is not a feeling, y'all. It's a choice. All right? So you may not feel like it, and I know it's hard sometimes, but remember, you, women, you are the doorway to your spiritual life in marriage. That's what the Bible says. Proverbs 21, better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than a house shared with a contentious woman. What's a contentious woman? That's a nag. All right, that's what that is. All right. Proverbs 27, move along before I get into trouble. <laughs> a quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. What does that mean? Stop tearing your husband down. Stop complaining. Quit being negative. Build up your home. Proverbs 31, she, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. See, a kind word, I believe, will go further than one spoken in haste and anger. We said last week, once you speak that word, that's it. I realize there's forgiveness. We're learning about that. But you only have one chance. That word, you have planted that seed. Even if the person forgives you, they remember that seed you planted. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and we all say things we shouldn't say from one time to another. But use your words to produce happiness in your home. When was the last time you told your husband he was a good man? Or when was the last time you thanked him for doing something? When was the last time you cut him some slack instead of saying, are you ever going to take out that trash? This is not, I mean, you, you need to say you're sorry once in a while. Say you were wrong once in a while. Ask your husband to forgive you. Say you need help. I'm going to have the worship team come back up here. We've got a few minutes. I may go a little bit long, but stick with me. It's important. Let me just end with this. There's a story in the Bible, 2 Samuel 3. And it's just a short little story you might miss if you, if you don't pay attention to it. And it's a story of a woman who's named Ritzpah. 
And she had three sons, and her three sons were taken captive and killed by the Gibeonites, their enemies, and then hung up out in the forest for the wild animals and the vultures to come and just pick their way at them. She found out where they were, and the Bible says that Ritzpah went and she camped there for three months. She camped there, and the Bible says she fought off the vultures. She fought off the wolves. She, she fought them. And the word came to the king, King David came to the king, and he sent aid to her, and the Bible says that he took those bodies down and gave them a proper burial. So what am I saying? Whatever's left of your family, your marriage, fight for it. Don't let the vultures tear away your marriage. It is worth the fight. This goes to men and women both. Don't allow the enemy to put fear in your life. Don't allow the enemy to tell you to give up. Fight for what's left. If she could fight for the bodies of her three sons to give them a proper burial, we can fight for what's left of our marriage. We can fight for what's left of our family. And if you fail, God forgives you, but start today learning how to embrace God's principles to have a healthy marriage tomorrow. Amen? All right, we've, we've set up communion today. Man, I feel like I just went through that fast, but next week, Pastor Dan and, and Emily Klotz are here from Cadillac, and they got a word for our congregation. They're, they're fired up about it. I can't wait to have them here, and I didn't really want to go into this the week after um, that they're here, two weeks from today, so I wanted to get this in today. But, uh, and if you want more help with marriage, we can recommend some books and things, but listen, it's always worth the fight. Now, we've been teaching on this topic of love, and we're going to continue for a few weeks, even after Dan and Emily are here. But before we uh, receive communion... I'm going to have the ushers in just a moment pass it around and just go ahead and take it. And as you're worshiping, take it with your family, pray with the people you're sitting by or whatever. But here's what I want us to focus on. Jesus said this. He said, however often you do this, remember me. Remember me. Uh, and, and, and people have really tied all kinds of religious ideas to communion, that you have to be a, 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 a member of the church or, or so have you. And that is, there is no teaching like that in the Bible. The Bible's very clear to just remember Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. And likewise, it says that he took the wine. We have uh, grape juice here. But he took the wine. He said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. And so we're remembering that it's Jesus' sacrifice that helps us to have healthy relationships, to rebuild relationships that have been hurt and burdened in some way. But listen, I want to read this, 1 Corinthians 13. We've read it once already, but I want to read it again. And as we sing this song about the love of God, I want this to be the impact with us today. Maybe you got someone here you need to forgive. Maybe you and your wife have been fighting. Maybe you've got some, some, some rocky things you've gone through. Maybe it's a good time to start today by receiving communion together and praying for one another. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. We read this early on, but let's read it again. Love suffers long and it's kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And, and it's really the love of God that we need in every one of our relationships and certainly in marriage. And so as we sing this one last song, let's focus on the love of God that never leaves us, never forsakes us. He's always with us. And he gives us that same love to reach out. So let's think about a relationship that needs the love of God. Maybe you've got a, a friendship or a neighbor, someone you need to pray for today who needs to know Christ. However you choose, let's take our time. We've got about five, six minutes together here as we receive communion, as we worship the Lord and focus on his love, which never fails us. Amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.